It's been almost four years since Michael Jackson died, but he continues to make headlines, some of them coming out of a Los Angeles courtroom right now, where his mother is suing for damages over his death from a powerful anesthetic in June 2009. But the headline of this story is that Michael Jackson is making more money after his death than he ever did when he was alive. Tonight, you'll hear about the most remarkable financial and image resurrection in pop culture history and get a rare look at what Michael Jackson left behind. The Michael Jackson brand is alive and well. Well paid, that is. Extremely well paid. Barcelona, Spain, the 297th performance of the Michael Jackson Immortal World Tour. Cirque du Soleil produces the show, featuring their acrobats and contortionists. But Michael Jackson, or at least his music, is the star. We sold 230,000 tickets in two days in Japan. We did 90,000 people in Moscow. 190,000 people in Mexico City alone. John Branca is an executor of Michael Jackson's estate, an architect, if you will, of how to make money off his legacy, most of which will eventually be turned over to Jackson's three children. Branca was Jackson's lawyer and advisor off and on for over 25 years and negotiated many of the singer's biggest deals during his lifetime. It's just unbelievable. Michael Jackson sells more tickets dead than most artists do alive. That is absolutely true. Worldwide box office now is over $300 million. And Michael has almost 60 million Facebook friends. He's the biggest selling artist on iTunes. And he's sold approximately 50 million albums since he passed away. It feels like you can't talk about all those great things about Michael without talking about the fact that his image was so battered and tarnished by the time of his death. Have his fans just forgotten about all of that? About all the weirdness? As managers of the estate, we, we don't really pay attention to the tabloids. We look at the Michael that we knew, the real Michael, the artistic genius, the visionary. The real Michael Jackson also told Ed Bradley on 60 Minutes that he let young boys sleep in his bed. You can't run away from that, right? You can't hide from it. Well, I, I don't recall that interview, and um, I just know the Michael Jackson that I knew was somebody I considered you know, a very honorable person. John Branca chooses Jackson. his words carefully. Another subject so. he doesn't like to discuss is Michael Jackson's family. Jackson's father and some of his siblings challenged Branca as executor and the validity of Jackson's will. But the California courts upheld the will and Branca's ability to carry out Michael Jackson's wishes. There was a series of wills and they were substantively almost identical. In that 20% went to charity, 40% went to his children, and 40% went to his mother as long as she was alive and on her death would go to the children. The basic principle never changed. Never changed. The whole objective of Michael's estate plan is to take care of his mother during her, her lifetime and to accumulate the principle and the assets for the benefit of Michael's children. The will named Branca and John McLean, a longtime friend of Michael Jackson, as co-executors. Jackson's crippled image was not the only thing they had to contend with. At first glance, Michael Jackson left more debt than anything. The day died, Michael Jackson had about half a billion dollars in debt. Zach O'Malley Greenberg is a senior editor for Forbes magazine, and he's been covering the estate since Jackson's death. How much did his lifestyle and his personality have to do with his debt? He never stopped spending like it was the 1980s. We charted it in Forbes. I mean, he was making 50, 60, 80, over 100 million dollars some of those years, and even into the 90s. But after the first allegations in 1993, uh, he never toured in the U.S. again. He never got another endorsement deal in his lifetime. The first allegations of child abuse? In 1993, correct. He became in many ways radioactive to brands and to sorts of companies that would contribute to those uh, massive paydays in the 80s. And the upkeep on a place like Neverland, you know, the spending on antiques and so forth, and uh, the maintenance of his entourage and all of that, you know, really, it really added up. This is one of how many warehouses that you Five. have? Five. 
you can see how he spent his money and some of what made up his extravagant lifestyle in this California warehouse. Wow, the Neverland. So, That's the actual sign from that, Neverland? That is the actual sign from Neverland that was over the gates. Karen Langford was friends with Michael Jackson and worked with him from 1981 until his death. She's now the archivist for the Jackson estate. There are rows and rows, floor to ceiling, of Jackson's possessions, most of it never seen publicly since he died. This warehouse is 20,000 square feet. Every inch of it is full. There are antiques and video games from Neverland Ranch. His Grammys. Best R&B vocal performance, male, 1983, Billie Jean. And 30 years of cars he never wanted to get rid of. Are these yeah. all Michael's cars? Uh, these are some of them. Some of them? Some of them. More cars. More cars. There's another Rolls Royce. Yeah, well, there's a, a few. Did he drive any of these cars? He did drive on occasion. Late in his life, Michael Jackson financed much of his lifestyle by routinely borrowing against his assets. But it wasn't these personal belongings that he used as collateral. Although the copyright value of his own songs was worth well in excess of $100 million, the crown jewel of his investment strategy was his portfolio of other people's songs, especially those of the Beatles. Tell me about the music catalog, the publishing catalog that you advised Michael to buy. We started with the Sly and the Family Stone catalog. We bought some rock classics, People Get Ready by Curtis Mayfield, Dion the Belmont's Run Around Sue, The Wanderer, When a Man Loves a Woman, Great Balls of Fire, Shake, Rattle and Roll. But then one day I got the call that the Beatles catalog was for sale. It was called ATV Music. And it was, it was as if we had hit the mo mother load. And you paid? The price was $47.5 million. And we later merged it with Sony's music publishing company to create one of the biggest publishers in the world, Sony ATV Music, that the estate to this day owns 50% of. And so how much is that worth today? I, I wouldn't want to speculate about what it's worth. But Come it, on, John. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't make all this money in this town without knowing what your investments are worth. Uh, well, it would be speculation at this point. It's, uh, it's estimated to be worth like a billion dollars. Michael's half? Yes. Well, you know, you never really know what something's worth until you go to sell it. Uh, and we are not sellers. We're, we are not going to sell any assets. At the time of his death, Michael Jackson had borrowed $380 million against the value of the songs he owned. So the estate had to move quickly to avoid losing the songs to creditors. John Branca sold future music rights to Sony for a reported $250 million. It was the biggest record deal in history. Branca's team also combed through personal video shot during rehearsals for a comeback tour Jackson was preparing for right before his death. The footage showed the talent Michael Jackson still possessed as a singer, dancer and entertainer, then 50 years old. It was made into a movie called This Is It and was released within months of Michael Jackson's death. So far, it's made over $500 million. A lot of companies got on board um, with Michael Jackson once they saw the success of This Is It, and once they saw, you know, Sony investing um, a quarter billion dollars for that record deal. Um, you know, then you see Pepsi coming back and doing an endorsement with him. You see Cirque du Soleil coming in and doing the show. Um, you know, I think that um, those first couple deals proved that Michael Jackson was no longer radioactive. And, so and death erased all his sins or even possible sins or suggestion of sins. I think his death caused people to remember him as he was in, uh, in the Thriller years. You started to hear Billie Jean and Beat It and Thriller on the radio all the time. I think that that transported people back to the mid 80s when Michael Jackson was at the peak of his career. That's what the Jackson estate and Cirque du Soleil gambled on. <laughs> Michael Jackson's 1983 Thriller video helped the Thriller album become the largest selling ever. It had seven hit songs on it. His music drives the touring Cirque du Soleil production. 
Jackson's estate and Cirque du Soleil are 50-50 partners. And while this show is expected to continue touring for years, a new production opens this week in Las Vegas. It's called Michael Jackson One, and we were allowed in to watch one of the final rehearsals. This show features more of classic Michael Jackson choreography and more of Cirque du Soleil's signature acrobatic production created by founder Guy La Liberté. Should people come here to see Michael Jackson or are they coming to see something else? I think people are coming here, yeah. yes, because they're passionate about Michael. So it's, it's very tricky because you're, taught, you're, you're touching an iconic figure uh, and uh, you have to be careful because the bass fans there are very, very uh, difficult and demanding. Making money on Michael Jackson's legacy is one thing. Keeping it is another. John Branca needed a team of lawyers to navigate a litany of claims against the estate. There were so many claims that were filed. And I can honestly tell you that most of them were ridiculous. Most of them were absurd. People making paternity claims and claims to have written all the songs that he ever wrote. And, you know, when you have an estate and you're in front of a court, you have to take these things seriously. Every single one? Every single one. Settling some, throwing some out? Throwing many out, settling the ones that we thought were valid. There's a couple that still pen are still pending. Also still a work in progress is the sorting of Michael Jackson's effects. Michael Jackson, personal clothing. Mm -hmm. This is what he wore. There's that famous jacket. There it is. Wow. That's amazing. This is one of the safes that we have. In Karen Langford showed us some of the more valuable items, which are kept in this safe, like this sequined glove he wore while on tour. It's estimated to be worth over $80,000 at auction. Can I touch it? Sure. Gently. Gently. Wow, it's kind of heavy. Mm-hmm. Look at that. I mean, you can't look at that without... Look how it sparkles. Yep. All of his belongings will be preserved until Michael Jackson's children come of age. This is his shoes. When they can decide what's to be done with all of it. The more time passes, the more its value and the more money his legacy generates. Executors Branker and McLean get 10% of what they make for the estate but their results speak volumes. They've already erased the half billion dollars of debt Michael Jackson had at his death. Since Michael Jackson died, the estate has taken in over $600 million. But That's, he died in 2009. He died in 2009. And he it's, made... It's in four years, roughly made, four years. 600, 600. Over $600 million, and that's more than any single living artist has made over that period of time. And he's not around to spend any other money. Correct. Hold for applause, hold for applause, slow umbrella fade out. Go to 60minutesovertime.com to see one of Michael Jackson's most personal items, his handwritten manifesto.